guys so much. I appreciate you stopping by with us hillbillies for a while. They're up there in that black dirt country clad. We got boulders and rocks and they got black dirt. But I guess God knew we was tougher than that. We need, he needed tough people. <laughs> anyway, take your Bibles this morning and kind of have them ready. They've got a list up there and uh, I want you to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Of chapter 13, I'm sorry. First Corinthians chapter 13. I want to say to all the visitors, we're so glad that you're here today. And I uh, hope that you've come to worship God with us. And uh, just want to encourage you in the Lord. Before I get started today, now I'm going to preach a message today that's kind of a dual line message. I've been preaching a series on storms of life. And, and uh, I'm going to preach another message on going through a storm. But I'm also going to preach a message on biblical, the journey to biblical manhood. And what I've been shocked about is how God is bringing these two themes together. Uh, on one hand, about the storms of life, and yet the journey to biblical manhood. And so God has brought this message together in those two veins today, and, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Hope that you'll just throw stuff out of your mind, get stuff out of, outside, and just focus your day now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13... Verse number 11, it says this. It did say that used to anyway. <laughs> you can see where I'm getting used to. When I was a child, I thought as a child. Is that right? When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. Now we go, I thought as a child. Spake, understood, thought as a child. But when I became a man. So God is saying here that there, we start out as a child. That there should be a time when we become a man. Now, ladies, you just enjoy yourself today, all right? And, uh, <laughs> but, but the truth about it is, most of the applications can go to anybody and everybody. Now, before we get started, I'd like for all the young men, you know, just, I don't care how old you are. If you just, you're just a young man, or your boy, uh, you might be five and you might be 25. I don't know, but would you stand today? Would you, would you I just want to see all the young men of this church. And as they stand, I want you to look around you. I want you to take a good sweeping look across this church. Back over there in the darkened, backslid area. Uh, several over there. All across here. Now I'm going to say something to you men today. We're preaching on a journey to biblical manhood. And I intrepidly preach this today. But I want to preach on the storm that you're going to go through on your journey to biblical manhood. I'm going to say something that may startle you. But I do not feel that I have arrived at biblical manhood. And I'm 70 years old and been preaching 42 years. This morning, young men, I'm going to preach primarily to you in, in hope. And I don't want you to feel like I'm after you because I'm not. I just want to encourage you in the Lord. But I want to preach today on the storm that's going to come into your life of lust and immoral Impure, moral impurity. And I, I, I hope today that you'll give me your ear and I hope that your fathers will give me your ear and give the Holy Spirit your ear. But we are living, a man said to me this week, and it's amazing how God brings people across your path. He said, Reggie, the average young man today is seeing more flesh, sensual, unholy flesh in one day than his great grandpa saw his entire lifetime. And I, I think about this, and yet I think this, is not been a, this has been a problem long before Internet ever came. This has been a problem back in Genesis. So we can't give ourselves the excuse that, well, it's just in front of me all the time. But I will say this to you. Now, you may not have, there may, among all these that are standing, you may have varying degrees of this storm of lust that you're going to go into. But my guess would be that every one of you at some point in your life are going to go through a storm and a battle over the issue of fleshly lust. And this message today is to try to encourage you and to strengthen you in the Lord and, and uh, enable you by God's grace and God's power to have victory through that storm. Amen. And you men may be settled and I want you to know I love you and my, um, and my I'll just tell you the truth. Uh, I again say, Lord, why have I found grace in thine eyes? And you, you young men will never know what you've done for me. Yeah. And encouraging me. 
I mean that. You young ladies. And I look up here and see this, and I want to encourage you. There's more room up here. And some of you out there want to get into saying there's more. We'll make room for you. We'll squeeze. Amen. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. So we're looking, when I became a man. What does it mean to become a biblical, biblical man? It is not just to become a physically grown person. What is it to become a biblical man? Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Look what it says, quit you like men. God has a biblical definition of what manhood is. He has it written throughout the pages of Scripture in the lives of people and in precept and statute and in judgment. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 13, the Bible says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, watch this, young men, because ye have, look at this verse, overcome the wicked one. Now I will say gun barrel straight to you that Satan, every young man in this church, whether you stood or did not stand, and every father in this church, and actually every person, Satan, that wicked one, wants to, rather than you overcome him, he wants to overcome you with moral impurity. He wants to devastate and destroy your life. And you may be sitting there today and saying, well, I just don't have any trouble with it. I'm glad for you, but you better get armed. Because you find out in the Bible this, when David was a young man, Tending sheep. And when he's a young man came to the battle with Goliath. David did not appear to have this kind of battle going on at that time. He had the aspirations and the purity and the joy of a young man wanting to serve God. But I'll remind you that as life went on. David had some real problems when it concerned the opposite sex women. And in fact what messed him up. If you'll study the Bible carefully. He was supposed to have gotten Michael, Saul's daughter, for a wife, and it didn't turn out. Are you listening to me? When that didn't turn out, and he felt that his legitimate wife was taken from him and stolen from him, it messed David up from that day forward in his attitude and his action toward women. And he began to see them and out of his bitterness and out of his anger and out of his frustration that things didn't, quote, work out like I thought they should. He ultimately and finally train wrecked his entire life and his descendants over this issue that I'm preaching today, moral impurity. So here's a young man, and I, I'll tell you the truth. I think about you young men, because in this church, the pattern that God has given me over the years is, Reggie, try to build strong, spiritually strong men. And if you have spiritually strong men that are sound in faith, sound in the Word of God, Saved men who know Christ and who are not arrogant and proud and cocky, but they're solid in their faith. They know what they believe and why they believe it. Then you'll have strong marriages. If you have strong marriages, you'll have a strong family. If you have a strong family, we'll, we'll have an effect upon this country and upon our community and our area. But it all starts with having manhood. Now, you don't have to wonder about the attack upon masculinity and manhood. It is full force on in this country, right? And I'm going to tell you something. God created Adam first. And ever since then, Satan has been an attack upon God's creative design against manhood. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm not talking about macho. I'm not talking about spit out the side tobacco and drink beer. I'm not talking about that kind of manhood. I'm talking about biblical manhood where a man has Christ in his heart. And though he fails and though he falls and though he's never what he would like to be, he still has a heart pointed toward glory land Amen. that says, God, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get up and go again. Amen. And I want to be a man of God for God. By the way, in the Bible, God continuously talks about the man of God, the man of God, the man of God. You know what will fix America? The men of God. Amen. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take somebody that's got the guts, the backbone to enter into the culture with the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the truth of God, so embedded in his heart, and he's got courage, and he will not back up, or he will not compromise with anybody about anything about the Word of God. Amen. And do it with a good attitude. When you look in this passage of Scripture, it goes on down and says in verse 14, the latter part of it there, I have written unto you, young men, because you're what? You're strong. And number two, the word of God abideth in you. 
We're talking about the journey to biblical manhood. Number one, in that upper verse, you need to learn how to overcome the wicked one by faith in Jesus Christ. We are overcomers because of our faith in Christ. First John chapter 5. Revelation chapter 2, there's seven times it talks about an overcomer. An overcomer is one who has trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, and through Christ we overcome. We are more than conquerors through him, through Christ. It's not because we're some kind of strong personality person. It's not because we're smart. It's not because we have a, a stubbornness or anything else. We're, we're overcomers in Jesus Christ. But because of that, God says you have some responsibility in verse number uh, there. He says to be strong in the Lord and the word of God needs to abide in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Now, the call to biblical manhood is a call to physical, mental, emotional, and especially spiritual strength. The raw truth of it is that the average American boy is a sexual slave. He cannot control his urges, his desires, his thoughts, his actions. He is totally in bondage and chain bondage to wicked sensuality. The result is a destroyed country. Because we've destroyed the home, the marriage, the family unit. And this stuff I'm preaching about today is there, of all the storms that you're going to go through that can affect not only you, but your children, your family, the churches. This storm right here has to be dealt with. Amen. What does it mean in practical daily reality? That you have spiritual strength. What does it mean to be, to have, uh, in the journey of spiritual manhood, to have the uh, uh, victory in the area of lust and immoral purity? That you have the spiritual strength to overcome and to defeat your flesh, the world, and the devil when they bring you into temptation. It is said of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. And may I say to you that Jesus Christ is our ultimate example. I mean, I know He's God and He's a Savior, but when we're looking at practical life. He is our supreme example of manhood. Somebody says, well, He never got married. I beg to differ with you. He has a bride Amen. that He's a spouse to. Alright, so don't, don't go there on me. He knows way more than you do about it. Amen. Look, 2.40. And the child, talking about Christ, grew and waxed, here it is, men, strong in spirit. Could I get a couple of you guys to move this board up here for me real quick? A couple of you young men, please move that board up here. Listen, here is the secret to victory over sensuality, is being strong in spirit. This is not taught, it's not even known in the world's whole expression of life. They teach you to do what comes natural, quote. Now, here's what God wants you to do. God wants you, if you're here and you're a young man, God wants you to, first of all, you are a spirit, a soul, and a body. God wants you to be strong in spirit. He wants that to be the strongest part of you. Then your soul is right here. And right here is your flesh. What does this drawing represent? That God wants you, by having the Word of God abide in you, by being filled with the Spirit, by being controlled with the Spirit, by having seriously dealt with this issue, that your spirit will so be in control of your life that your flesh cannot dominate it. What's going on is, is very little spiritual strength and they're over-dominated by their, by, their, by their body. And because boys and young men have no spiritual strength, then they're taken down because of the weakness of their spirit. You're gonna, if, if you're going to win in this battle, in this storm, and you're going to be successful in the journey to become a real biblical manhood, you're going to have to come to a place of where you're able to conquer your own flesh, your own, your own, the world and the devil in this area of physical. There is no issue where more boys have been destroyed and more men and husbands. By the way, can I say to you, what you do... While you're still single with this issue is going to affect the happiness of your marriage. 
It's going to affect how you look at your wife. It's going to affect every area of your life. If you get yourself distorted before marriage and you get yourself messed up before you marry that girl, you're going to look at life and marriage through the eyes of the world's distortion and perversion of even what marriage is supposed to be. This, I cannot overemphasize the seriousness of this. I don't care if you can, fo- if you can quote me uh, six books of the Bible. If you're not strong here, you're weak. I don't care if you've been to Bible college and seminary and everything else. Can I tell you that even back 30 years ago when I was a young preacher, some people, and I'm not going to name the denomination, but it's up here in Springfield, that a man bids with me whose mother worked in this licensing office of that denomination up here in Springfield, that he said that the average of 12 preachers per day had their licenses taken away from them because of immorality in their lives. Can I tell you that in this town here, in this town, I, I could spend the next 15 to 20 minutes talking about preachers who have been taken down by the, the issue of immorality. It is not a light issue. If this were the last message I'd ever preach, I would say, perk up your ears, make up your mind today that God needs to do something in you because I'm telling you something. You do not know how weak your flesh is. I am telling you something. You do not know what you would do if you were given the chance and the opportunity and in the position and the place to get yourself be destroyed. Now, God, I'm going to, let's get something settled today. Real good and quick. Hold on to yourself. God... Designed, created, and made man. The first commandment he ever gave man was what? Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Anybody got any idea how that happens? Don't come in Easter eggs. It means you're going to meet a lady. She becomes your wife. You have... uh, Intimate relations together, physical relations together, and God conceives a child out of that? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to say something gun barrel straight to every boy in here. Don't you, don't you miss this. It is not wrong for you to have strong physical desire to have a wife. Amen. Did you hear me? Don't you let the devil get you conflicted and convoluted about, well, I shouldn't even think about this. You know, I'm feeling this way toward a girl. That's not wrong as long as you keep it within the perimeters of God's word. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. So let's get this straight. We're not up here preaching, don't do that, don't do that. No, no, we're saying keep the urges and desires that God has given you which are given you of God, just keep them within the perimeters of God's Word. But don't get yourself where you feel feel dirty or you feel bad because you want to be married and have a wife. By the way, can I say to you girls, do the same thing. (laughs) Don't let the devil tell you that that's bad to want a husband. Can I just go further? Don't think it's bad to be romantic. And intimate? You said, I wish you wouldn't preach in front of our kids. Well, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I'm not sending the kids downstairs. And you go you go home and straighten up what I messed up, would you? Say, well, how are we going to tell you? Brother Reggie, you, know, you can say, I'm going to have a lot of explaining to do. Well, your kids really ain't too stupid. They're not really dumb. Okay. Well, Jesus was strong in spirit. Then it says something else. It says that, watch this, he was strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. That means he knew what to do and when to do it. He knew what not to do and when not to do it. And the grace of God was upon him. Now I'm going to throw you all a little something. How many believe Jesus is God? How many believe Jesus is holy man? He's God man. Did you know what, boys, let's do it. The Bible said that Jesus was tempted... In every point as you are, yet without sin. Now I realize that's Jesus, okay? But yet he was tempted. You said, you think, are you telling me that Jesus was tempted in his flesh about a woman? Yes, I'm telling you that. But your Bible says tempted in every point. I think that's one of the points that a man's tempted in. In fact, it may be the biggest point man's tempted in. 
Did you know what men will do? Men will let go of all their wealth for a woman. He will. They do it all the time. Run off with some gal. Leave it all. Just to have a lover. Oh boy, this is going to get good. Let me tell you girls something. Just well lay it on the line. If I'd wanted to cook, my mama was a good one. I didn't marry her for a cook. She's a good cook. That's not why I married her. I didn't marry her to do laundry. I was hiring that done before I met her. You know why I married her? I wanted to love her. I want to tell you girls something you need to understand. That God put in men an absolute, uh, better, not any better, an overdrive about physical drives. Just being honest with you. You better understand that. Better get a hold of it. Those drives, though, must be brought under the power and control of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Without it, it'll turn into a forest fire of perversion. Okay? So here was the key. The grace of God was upon him. What does that mean? Grace, one of the definitions outside of unmerited favor, which is the passive definition, one of the definitions in which I love, and I think more aptly fits the definition of grace than anything I know of, is the desire and the power... To obey God. Amen. Now watch this. So God gives you the desire to have a mate, the desire to have a, a wife, the desire to have a lover, and He gives you the power. You have in you the power of procreation. Seed. Right? So what God does, God didn't say to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish, and not give him the grace to do that. This is why in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it talks about the husbands dwelling with the wife, according to knowledge, yeah. that as being heirs together of the grace of what? Life. 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 Yeah. yeah. I want to tell you something right now. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know how to say that. I'm trying to be discreet. There's nothing more beautiful, nothing more wonderful than a loving relationship, an intimate and physical relationship, and the loving relationship of a husband and wife. I don't care what you say. I think God made it to be that way. I believe God made it to be that way. I believe God intended for you to enjoy each other. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I mean, tell you what, if you don't, don't never kiss them again. I'm just saying. I don't want to get off in left field here, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a bunch of boys in this church house. I don't want you to train wreck. Amen. I don't want you, I don't want you being a bunch of prudes. Yeah. By the way, while I'm thinking of it, just let me throw this in for salt. Got a large congregation here. A lot of girls. A lot of boys. You say, well, how am I going to get... I saw one. I'd like to get hooked up with her. How are you going to do that? I'll, you just look at her and look at her and look at her and smile at her and smile at her. And, no. I want to say something to you. Be friendly. Be friends to everybody here. Amen? Ain't no, I tell you, we ain't got no Queen of Sheba's in this church house. We ain't got no Romeos around here. We're all just made out of the same old dirt. But God does have a plan for you. I do believe that. I tell you, I tremble when I think if I'd have got anybody but Karen. I mean, I'm telling you, I'd be in federal pen probably. I'm serious. God's got somebody for you. I believe that with all my heart. But I'm going to say this to you. In this church, now here's what I always suggest. How old are you now? I was afraid of that. He's 15. Now, I'll bet you anything. I want to ask you, it's okay? <laughs> kind of okay? Have you seen any girls here at this church at all that kind of caught your eye? I'd rather not huh? <laughs> He'd rather not answer that. <laughs> Can I tell you that's a great big yes? <laughs> and it's okay. Can I tell you it's okay? <laughs> Them Wilson kids, they'll give you one every time. I tell you, they'll get you. You ain't getting around them. But it's okay to have an interest in a girl. Now, how you go about something? Now, we're going to talk sometimes. Now, if you are, you're an interested girl, 
And, and you know, the girls have a way of letting you know whether they're interested or not, right? Yeah, come on. And they have a way of letting you know they are interested. <laughs> so what do you do when all of a sudden you realize we could possibly be glory to God Almighty? I could. There might be a girl. What do you do? Well, you start praying about it. You might even talk to your mom and dad about it. Wouldn't that be amazing? And say, you know, what do you think about that girl? And your dad may say, stay away from her, son. Believe me. You know, I don't. And you go, well, dad, I like. I don't know. Can I tell you something? Respect everybody's, you know, I, I told somebody this past week, I think, I've seen people say, I'm not for that, and they don't even know why. But I'm not for it. Couldn't explain to you. Don't got nothing against that young person, that boy, that girl. But I'm just, something in me says, I'm not for that. Now I'm going to tell you a little something here. Let's get this up. If, I can't remember your first name right now. Clay. Clay. Clayton, okay. okay. Clay. If you're in this church, have you seen any girls in this church that looks kind of... <laughs> He's nodding his head. Could you tell me and tell us all who it is? <laughs> Boy, that's a no, no, no. <laughs> but Clayton here, I want to tell you something. I'm going to advise you something. If you're truly, and you get down the road here, how old are you now, 18? Huh? 16. Okay, when you're 16, that was a little play on words. I wanted to make you feel good. Okay. 18, you know. Clayton, let me get down the road and you interest a girl. My advice to you is really talk to your mom and dad about her. And just say, you know, I don't know if there's anything here or not, but I kind of got an interest in that girl. Pray with me about that. Yeah. If you got anything you want to say to me, I'd be. And then get down the road. If you really think something's on, go to her dad. Yeah. Yeah. Go to her dad and just say, listen, you know, I. I, I just be honest with you, I kind of like your daughter. <laughs> I mean, I know you don't want to hear this, but <laughs> daddies are crazy. They think it was just fine when they told somebody else's daughter, but when somebody comes to get their daughter, it is a whole other world. Aren't we hypocrites? I mean, really, you know. I just say, listen, I just want you to know, I mean, resident, and would you be against me kind of, you know, seeing how it goes? And I promise you this, I'll never subvert you. Now, you listen to me. Don't ever subvert a girl's daddy. Don't ever subvert her daddy. And just kind of, you know, and take it from there. How to do it past that, I don't know. Smile, grin, whatever you want to do. I ain't even going west with you. Talk, but my big deal is just work through your parents. Be respectful of other people. And can I say something to you? If that dad says to you, Clayton, my daughter is 15 stories better person than you are, and I wouldn't have somebody like you marrying her because that thing ever happened on the face of this earth. Look, run. Run. Okay, now, but here's the thing. You come home and say, Daddy, I talked to him. He told me that his, his daughter was way up here, and I was down here, and he would never let. And so all of a sudden, you go going to come to church and go, they think they're better than we are. <laughs> yeah, right? right. Uh, he, he, he thinks his daughter's too good for my boy. So we're going to sit on the other end of the church. <laughs> and if I run across them back there at the bathroom, I'll give him the evil eye. You gotta watch this garbage. This is all garbage out of hell. Goes on in churches all the time. And you know what? You're probably right. If that's what they think, fine, let it go. Don't get mad at them. God may be protecting you from a terrible life. Because if he thinks his girl's that high, she's already ruined. Anyway, boy, I'm way off track right now. Okay. All right. He was filled with it. Now, here's the thing. God gives grace. What you want is the grace of God involved in this matter. God will give you grace. We talked about this issue up here. Now, I want everybody, put 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5. All you boys, open your Bibles up to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to talk about some issues. I don't know how this is going to go today. I'm doing my best. I promise you I am, but it ain't going to the speed I wanted it to go. 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Thank you, guys. I probably jumped. Yes, I did. Watch this verse. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith what? Wait a minute. Well, I need a Bible college degree after I'm saved. I need knowledge. I need temperance. I need patience. I need godliness. Godliness. I need brotherly kindness. After you get saved, 
Add to your faith. What's the very first thing God says to add to it? This is why this message is important. Virtue. What is virtue? Moral excellence, moral strength, moral power. I, I looked up at Webster's 1825 on this. What, the strength and the power to live within God-ordained moral laws. The strength to resist moral temptation and vice. To live happily through love in obedience to God's word. Moral excellence ordered, watch this, from the heart and the spirit that will control your flesh and keep the flesh from moral and sensual sin. Virtue comes from the spirit of God. Virtue controls the mind. Can I tell you something? Every girl that's wearing a dress down to here, heart not right. I, I, didn't, I hope that didn't come out wrong. Just because a girl dresses modestly does not mean her heart and her mind is where it needs to be. Okay? Outward, actually, the truth about it is, if you're not careful, Satan will have you cloaking yourself outwardly in all demonstration of being what blah, 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 but inside full of dead men's bones. Okay? So you want to be careful about that. It's not always because if, by the way, let me just say this here. I've got a suit and a tie on up here. I'm a pastor of this church. Woo, 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 woo. If I go home and I'm watching pornography, you tell me where I'm at. It's all a joke. A total, hypocritical, nonsensical joke. By the way, we're talking about what you can see. Boys, I'm going to tell you something right now. The p w virtue will enable you to turn away pornography that comes up on your phone. Because it's going to come up on there. How many would admit me as a man, if you have Facebook or a, a phone, you, it, that junk will come up. There'll be some gal on there with a bikini on. Did anybody else see it? I guess I'm the only one. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. But it's pop, when I open my phone up, there'll be a deal of reels across the top. Yeah. Virtue is the ability to just immediately wipe away from it. Out. You're going to have to, you say, well, I just don't think I'd have a phone then. That might be good. I don't know. But I'm going, how are you going to get away from all of it in culture right now? I don't see it. The answer is not that we've got to get rid of everything. You may be in Mountain Grove next week and here comes some gal down the street. And she ain't got nothing on. What are you going to do with that? Wipe her off the street? <laughs> You're going to have to have virtue. You're going to have to have something. And I'm not talking about acting super holy in the world. I don't look at that kind of thing. No, I'm just saying, you know, just... Uh, She's a person. You know what I, I literally get into where I just feel so grieved for those girls. I, I'm so sorry for them that they just sold themselves out to sensuality and attention getters and all. And they just do this stuff to be attractive to people. And they think this is what life's about. That is so, that is so far, that's so, it's so sad that our girls are being made to believe that if they're sensual and half naked that this is the way you live it out. And a, that's so sad. Well... He said, it's virtue. It comes from the Spirit of God. It controls our mind and our heart. And it controls then the outward action because of the power that's in. Amen. Such as when you see, when you have something that's seductive or even your own imaginations. That's why the Bible said, casting down imaginations. All right, guys. Real time. How many of you know that you don't have to see any pornography or anything and you can have an imagination in your heart? In your mind. Okay, maybe I'm the most wicked guy in six states. I don't know, but you can have thoughts come in your mind that are wicked. You didn't see nothing. you got to have virtue. God didn't say go to God in this. God didn't say go all this other stuff. God said the very first thing to get after you're saved is virtue. Men, without it, your marriage is going to split. Without it, your children are going to wind up with a broken home. Amen. Having your God-given desires, physical desires, under the control of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. We'll take off down through several verses now and, and, and cut and go here. Flee all full, soul, youthful lust. Can anybody tell me somebody in the Bible that did that? Joseph, Joseph did that. He fled. He ran. Guys, there are times and places when you need to get out of there. Get out of there. 
Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. God said, if you don't keep this virtue, if you don't keep your heart, it will get you. Matthew 5, 27, 28. Thou hast heard it, but said to them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Watch the level of, level of spiritual life go up where Christ really deals with the problem. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman with lust, to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And you're going to need to be able to separate this, a God-given desire to have a mate, to have intimacy, to experience that marital love, and a lustful damaging to her. You don't care how this affects her life, okay? There is a difference between that God-given desire and a selfishness that you don't care who all you destroy, you're going to fulfill your lust. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. But every man is tempted... When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. What's he saying? If you have the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God in you, when you're tempted, you will not be enticed and drawn away. Let me tell you right now, I mean, this is happening 90 miles an hour all over this country. People are being enticed. They're being drawn away. Why? Because they have no spiritual strength. And can I say to you, I'm not going to be able to come up here today and preach to you spirit, and give you spiritual strength. I may say some things, introduce you things, and point you toward the cross. But in the end, it's going to take Jesus Christ, it's going to take you and Him and the Word of God to deal with this issue. Amen. And you're going to have to sit today and make up your mind. You know what? I want Today, I want God to do something in me that gives me the power. A loving, joyful obedience to the Word of God that I will not be drawn away and enticed by this stuff. Amen. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, The flesh lusteth against the walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do things that you would. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. My son, attend to my wisdom, bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, that thy lips may keep knowledge, for the lips of a strange woman droppeth the honeycomb in her mouth is smoother than all. Her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Watch this thing. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. I'm going to say something straight up here today that needs to be said. Most young virgin boys... Do not lose their virginity with some girl who's never been to rodeo. They get hooked up with a gal that has already messed herself up, and all she wants to do is mess everybody else up. And she looks at a boy, and she just thinks he's he's a prize. That's what your Bible teaches, and it's true. She's going to take you to the rodeo. Stay away from her. Amen. That's what it's all about. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, thou canst not know them. Verse 7, Hear me now, therefore, ye children, depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her. Come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. And not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost, watch this, everybody, get this. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation, the assembly that was sitting right in church. And my mind was on lust. My mind was on uh, getting in bed with some gal here in church. And the preacher was preaching and they were singing. And I looked over and saw that woman. And my mind went wild after her. That's what it says right there. You say it ain't happened. Well, you tell me then why so many preachers got kicked out of the ministry or lost ministry over lust. Why so many people got so messed up. Why you got people with other men's wives everywhere across the country going to different churches that used to go together. Not right there. Look at verse 15. Here's instruction to me. Drink waters out of thine own sister and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad. Rivers of water and street. Talk about your children. Let them, that fountain, those children be your own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be thou ravished always with her love, not somebody else. That's Bible. That's Bible. Why wilt thou, my son, be ravaged with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? By the way, let me say the high, the higher level of this is false religions. The strange woman is a picture of a false religion. So there is actually two layers, but we're not going there today on this. Now watch this. Embrace the bosom of a stranger. 
The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He pondered all going. I promise you, you're never going to be nowhere with, with nobody at any time, any place. I don't care how dark it may be. But what God Almighty, he, he sees in the dark like he sees in the light. He knows what you're up to. He knows where you're at. He knows what's going on. You ain't going to get by with it. Amen. And be sure. If you don't you check it out, ask David. Amen. Be sure your sin will find you out. Amen. The old preachers used to preach that. We need to be preached again in America. He said there, verse number 22, For his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. He shall die without instruction, and the greatness of the folly shall he go astray. And America's streets are full of boys and young men who don't want to be married, who don't want to take the responsibility of a wife, who don't want to take responsibility of their children, and they're just roaming the streets and selling drugs and becoming pimps and all that kind of junk, and they think that's the life. I'm telling you something, the gates of hell are waiting for them, and they're so fooled by all the junk, it's crazy. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. Proverbs 6, verse number 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproves the destruction of the way of life. To keep thee. What? What's the Bible about? To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulterers will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, the fire of lust, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Watch this. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. Can I tell you, boys, the, that girl you hook up with, uh, she's going to be possibly, probably will be somebody else's wife someday. You're violating that, that commandment right there. You always want to look at a girl as somebody's daughter and somebody's potential wife, and it could be yours. What would you want some other boy to do with her and to, toward her that you, would, that, you, that you wouldn't want done? By the way, can I just say something here? I'll tell you, if this scalds hell, I don't care. Most girls, they grow up kind of innocent, dreaming of having a husband that loves them, cherishes them, kind to them, provide for them, protect them, and kind of a, kind of a Romeo. Now, there ain't none of us in here are that, but you dream while you can, okay? <laughs> But I would like to suggest that the boys and young men of this church and the men, grown married men, that we treat ladies in here like they dreamed. Amen. That a man would be a gentleman. Amen. Be honorable. Amen. Want her best. Amen. Not out to use her and throw her away. Amen. And I'll tell you girls something. Men who are not biblical men will use you and throw you straight away. They'll just throw you away like trash in a bag. A biblical man will not do that to you. I, I, I don't know why, but I just have such a burden for young ladies that just are hoping, you know, and dreaming that they could have a home and a family someday and a husband that really does love them. And his heart is to her, not other people. That he's not always looking at the other women around a lot. I want to just ask a question. How many girls would you just like to have a husband that loves you? Anybody in here like that right there? Yeah. We're talking about biblical manhood. Go on up here, men, uh, older men of Mary. Let's go on up verse 30. Men do not despise the thief. He still satisfies soul home. But if he be found, he should restore seven fold. He should give all sons house. But whosoever commits adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. And you listen to me, that's true. Jealousy, the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. This is for men who, this is beyond your, your, your boy time now. This is when you've married and you mess with another man's wife. Let me tell you something right now. You know one reason we can't have revival in America? Because, don't, please don't take this wrong. If you've been through a divorce and you've been through ravaged life, and I'm for you, not against you, but I'm telling you right now, there is so much bitterness and animosity setting in our churches toward former spouses. And, and, and I can't believe my ex, my ex, my ex. You've wiped them off the face of the earth, haven't you? My ex, my ex, my ex. Where'd you get that from? Where did you get that somebody who Christ died for 
that may be a, quote, bad person. Where did you get this X? What is our attitude? Maybe that's the attitude that made it turn out to be an X. You know what the whole deal is? You know what will support and undermine the whole thing? It's love. Do you know how to be a biblical man? Loving. Loving God. Loving others. Hey, if I love the women in this church, I'm not going to be after them. If I love Karen, I'm not going to be after them. If I love God, I'm not going to be after them. It's just the truth. And we can talk about all the yes, do this, do this, don't do that, blah, blah, blah. But you know what it really all boils down to? Do I have the love of God enough in my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit that will make me have a loving desire to do right before God Almighty and toward those other people? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. We'll go on. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon my fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. Call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman. Boys, please listen. The stranger which flattereth with her words. Remember I said a while ago, it's not going to normally be some young girl that's never been kissed before. By the way, I just encourage you, you know, just don't be kissing till you're married. <laughs> That's just good stuff, amen? Let me keep from the strange ones, from the stranger flat words. I, for, watch this. For I looked at the window of my house and looked through my casement. Behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, a subtle of heart. She's loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She is without now in the streets. Life and wait at every corner. This is what Hollywood is constantly pushing. Constantly. Every way they can. Is to do this right here. Now she's without. She caught him. She kissed him. With an impudent face said unto him. I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. I found thee. Oh baby doll. I found you. I've decked my bed with cover strings, a tapestry with carved works, with fine linen in Egypt. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our love, a fill of love till the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. Now watch this. This has a specific situation here, but you can apply it in so many ways. She, this young man has some reservations about this. This is another man's wife. So what's she got to do? She's got to break down his concerns, his fears, his inhibitions. This is why I say this can be applied in so many levels of human relationships. Satan's goal is to break down your natural and God-given concerns about what you're doing. So here's how she did it with this guy. The good man is not at home. Well, yeah, but he could come home. Uh-uh. He's, on, he'll come, he's, uh, he's gone a long journey. You don't have to worry about my husband being here. He's taking a bag of money with him and come home with the day appointed. I know when he's coming home, you don't have to worry about it. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield, and with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Now watch what it said this boy is like, this young man's like. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare, know not that it is for his life. Hearken to me now, ye therefore, ye children, attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, to go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, many strong... What? Then here we'll stop right here. Many strong men have been slain by her. I will remind you of a boy who killed Goliath and won a war. Was slain by this. And if you think this stuff isn't true, I wish David could come down here and preach to us today. Because I see David looking across the battlements, and he sees a man running. And he asked them, who is it running? And they told him. And he sees another man coming in behind him, and he says, who's that? And he said, he's a bearer of good news. And they come running up there, and get cut through this short. One of the runners says, he asked him, is the young man Absalom safe? And he said, I would that God, all your enemies would be like this young man. And David knew that Absalom was dead. And if you ever want to read the result 
Do you ever want to read what really goes on behind the door? Read David as he's walking across the battlement and saying, Oh, Absalom! Oh, Absalom! My son, my son! Oh, Absalom! My son! With God, I died for thee! And I think Absalom would have said, Daddy, this all started back over there one day when you got up out of bed in the afternoon. And you walked out on the rooftop and you saw Bathsheba bathing down there. And daddy, this is how this all got here. You think this book isn't real? Sometimes I, you, know, you could watch the news for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week for 6 years and you cannot hear the truth in it. You could go to the American public schools for 40 years and you'll never hear the truth about nothing. Many young, many, if she have cast down, many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain, but her in her house is the way to hell, going down the chambers of death. Go to, Rome, uh, go to Proverbs chapter 9. I, I could give you story after story. Go to Samson. His eyes are out. He's got chains and cuffs on his feet and on his hands. And he's walking round and round in circles, grinding for the Philistines. Finally, in death, God allows him to pull the pillars down. Why? Daddy, I want that girl. I'm going to have that girl. I'm going to have that girl. I'm going to satisfy my fleshly desires, irresponsible of what God's Word says. God, you just take a flight, because I'm doing what I'm going to do, what I want to do. Ask Samson this morning. Samson, how did it all go for you? You see, Satan has a really good way of making you see somebody who used it. And you think, well, they're getting, they got by with it. Everything's going great for them. God ain't wrote the last chapter yet. You better hang on. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13. A foolish woman's clamorous. She's simple, knoweth nothing. She sit at the door of her house, seat in a high place, city, call her passengers to go right on their ways. Who is simple, let him turn in thither. For, for him he wanteth understanding. She saith, in him stolen waters are sweet. Bread eating in secret is pleasant. But he, that young man, knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Go to Proverbs chapter 18. Oh, man, this isn't working out real good. Proverbs 18, 22. We're going to try to finish. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. God's not against you having a wife. He just wants you to go about it right. Proverbs 19, 14. House and riches of the heritage of the fathers and a prudent wife is from the Lord. I'll say amen right there. Ecclesiastes 9, 9. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity. God wants you to enjoy your marriage. God wants you to enjoy your relationship. Now, let's go back to this thing a little bit. I'm going to try to finish her out. Let me just talk about, I want to say one more thing before many strong men have been slain by her. FDR, the day he died, does anybody know what was going on in his life? FDR was with Lucy Mercer, whom he had committed adultery with years before, in the early days of his life. And he and his wife, uh, Eleanor, had come to a social marital agreement. And he had promised to never see Lucy Mercer again if she would support his political ambitions. I want to show you how strong and powerful physical urges are outside of the, of the Bible. FDR is in, he's polioed. He can't walk. He can stand like this and he can make it look like he walked, but he really wasn't. He was in horrible, horrible physical condition. World War II is coming to an end. It's 1945 in April. He tells his wife, I'm going down to the, watch this, the hot springs in, uh, uh, in Georgia. He's having his portrait painted while he's there. But guess who's with him? Lucy Mercer. His old adulteress. And he's sitting there, Kenny. And the guy's painting his portrait, getting pretty close to being done. And FDR says, oh, I have a terrific headache. And it goes out through the airways that FDR is dead. Harry Truman is sworn in president. Does anybody think that's an accident? 
John F. Kennedy was probably the most adulterous president this nation's ever known. Wrecked more young women's lives than you can even probably count this afternoon. He raped a virgin girl right in the White House one day. That's historical fact now. John F. John F. Kennedy teaching America that you can be a big dude and be a hustling Hollywood and a, a porn head and you can be a, a, a nasty magazine. What's them old magazines they used to have? Hustler and Playboy and all that stuff. You can do all this stuff and you can be somebody. He's going down to Texas getting ready for the election. He's driving in an open vehicle. Bullet hits him right there and blows the top half of his brain off. God will write the last story. You watch what I tell you. You say, well, I know some people did some terrible things and they ain't happened to them yet. Just hang on to your horses. Great men, powerful men, are taken down by this stuff. Now, that's what scares me about our, politi- our political situation right now. But here's what I want to try to close out with. Boys, God gave you that desire to have a wife. I don't want you feeling guilty about that. You just keep it within the perimeters of God's word. There is such a thing as an awakening of physical drives. There's natural curiosity that becomes an awareness. It awakens your conscience. If you're not, and if you're not careful, as you start moving away, you'll try to displace guilt. Can I tell you something? When you have violated your conscience and God gives you guilt, deal with it. And say, Lord, I was thinking thoughts I shouldn't have been thinking. And I want you to straighten that up for me and make me a biblical man. God's design and God-given desires are not sinful or wicked, only outside of God's Word. This storm is so powerful, it is so prominent in this world, that unless you have God's strength and power, you will not win this battle. Learn, I want to give you some things to appreciate, and this goes for everybody, all of us. Learn to appreciate your conscience. Do not let your conscience get seared by pushing God away all the time. God gave you a conscience that when you thought this or did this or had this intent, his, your conscience is going to bother you. That will bring, watch this, guilt. The world hates guilt. Guilt to your spirit is what pain is to your body. It is a warning that you're heading, there's something wrong. Okay? Do not throw guilt off. Admit it. And deal with it. Confess it. Turn from it. Shame, watch this, shame is valuable. Biblical shame is valuable. There are things we should be ashamed of. The world will tell you don't be ashamed of anything. Fear can be a powerful thing in your life. Fear of what will happen, the results of this. And just for all of us men, Job 31 says, he said, uh, I made a covenant with mine eyes, why then should I think upon a maid? Job had had ten children. He was not a young man. Okay? But I give you Joseph today, Genesis 39, and we'll close here. Genesis 39, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Everybody tell me what he said to her. He refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master was not what was with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Now watch this statement. Here's the secret. Here's the secret to virtue. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Total different mindset. The average young man thinks, I get by with this. You don't tell, I won't tell. Be sure you send to find you out. You, 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 how, how old ever story about Joseph if he hadn't done this in his life? Whole, his whole story of life would be totally different if he hadn't had that one thing. And right there is virtue. And he didn't say, I'm afraid my mom and daddy might come in. He didn't say, I'm afraid your husband might come in. What did he say? What was the basis of his decision? Sinning against God. And that has to be your and I's basis. I'll give you these things here. Because it's not enough to say something's wrong. How do we do it? Number one, 
ask God to give you such a love for him and for others that he would keep you virtuous. There is no higher power than love. I can get up here and preach, and I didn't want to get off. I said, I'm going to stay right down the pulpit and preach straight through this thing, and that didn't happen. But all my preaching is not going to do this. It's going to take something to happen between you and God. I want the pianist to come. Secondly, young men, see around the curve. See behind the door. What's going to happen? Now you listen to me. With all of my heart, this is the first church to salvage yard. Amen. There are no perfect sinless people in this church house. And I'm going to say something to all the men, the grown men in here. I'm 70 years old, and Brother Carr, I still fight off, have to fight off immoral, impure thoughts. I'm sorry if you don't like that. I'm sorry. I've told you I'm worse sinner. It is. You go, oh, I get old. I'll be fixed. No, it don't. Job had ten children. David had had several wives. Solomon. I mean, just... That's getting old is not a fix for this. I preached a message years ago on a black uh, box that an old man in a nursing home had, and he was all the time talking about everybody about Jesus in the nursing home. When he died, they opened up his stuff and he had a black box down there full of Playboy magazines, been putting on the dog the whole time. Love the Lord, learn to see around the curve. What's going to happen? Now, what did Jesus say? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Stay alert and pray. God, lead me not into temptation. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You see something ain't right? Get away from it. You've got to take action. You can't just sit there and be a, huh. You know what our real problem is? Down inside, we are truly wicked adulterers. And we like it. That's just a problem. We've never, we've never repented toward God. We've never had a godly sorrow. Yeah. Oh, now, I, I, hey, boys, let's just, boy, this here, this here, this split, this, this, will, this will split the roof. All you young men, and I want all you dads to stand up. All you daddies stand up. You, you're a dad, stand up. If you don't care, appreciate it. Lonnie, you got two daughters, right? How'd you like for some man in this young in this church to ruin your daughter? Tim, you gay girls? I can't never keep it. I'm gonna ask you, Tim. How'd you like for some young man in this church to ruin your daughter? Now thank God you get yourself messed up. There's forgiveness, there's redemption, but things I'm telling you something, the sin has scars to it. Brother Justin, how'd you like for one of these young men mess your daughter up? And then throw her in the ditch like she's nothing. I want you boys that stood at the start of this service to look around you, and I want you to see these dads. And if you think, I want to ask you a question. What would you do with her if her dad was there? How are you going to act toward her if her daddy's standing there? Especially Kenny. <laughs> I love old Kenny. Just think about it. What would you want? Now, let's raise it higher. Yeah. Our God. Yeah. Our God. And I'm just pleading with... If I die this week, and this is going to be some Sunday, I'm going to preach my last message here. And it's coming on a lot quicker than I'd probably like to realize. But if I was to give you one thing, boys treat these girls in this church and everywhere else with the deepest respect. Amen. She was given to that family by God. Amen. She is not somebody's trash. Amen. She is not for you to steal and rob from and ruin and you walk away from her. Amen. Now you guys be seated. Now I'm going to close it out like this. The piano starts playing down. You listen to me. I, I don't like, I was going to date truth. I don't like manipulated altar services. I don't. 
I don't like you. It's those we have this. But here's what I'm going to ask real quick. If there are young men in this church say, Reg, today, I know I'm weak. I know I could be the first to fall, but I would like God to give me strength and virtue. That if I'm not married, that I'll treat women right. And I'll, I'll respect these girls at this church. And I'm going to say this to you. Daddies, if your boy comes to pray, I'll tell you what I want to do is invite you. I don't you initiate your boy coming. But if he comes, I'd pray what I'd do if I was your dad. If I was that daddy, I'd say, son, I won't beat you. No, I'm with you. And I may not have been the best example to you, but I tell you, I hope you can do better than, than I did. And if your son's asking God Almighty to give him virtue, I'd at least let him know I'm backing you. If you're a young man here today, maybe you're married. Maybe you're 70. But I need help. God, I need help. My flesh is weak. I don't have this in myself. I need God. We, we say we came to worship Him. We say we came to worship Him. Part of that worship is, Lord, we need You. Lord, we need You. Brother Glam sent me a text this week encouraging me in my health, and I so appreciate it. You're a lot better pastor than I am. But just one thing I'd just like to see God do. How many knows that I didn't, Brother Glidden did it. Nobody I know has made what's happened among the young people of this church. It's a, Sister Connie, it's unusual. I marvel. I, I, I just look and I say, God, what are you doing in our congregation? To see all these young people getting up here with a smile and the joy of the Lord and and, and decently dressed and the boys looking like boys and the girls looking like girls and but I want us to go deeper I would like for there to be a spirit of holiness I want your pastor I do not want to be looking at anybody in this church or outside this church with unholy thoughts and so I say I, I start and then it has to be us daddies and us fathers said so, oh God keep us from unholy Desires, unholy, unbiblical desires. If we do that, then I think it'll make sense for our sons. I think they'll see something. Would you come? Your young man back there, let me tell you something. You ain't going to win this on your own. You are not that stout. You are not that tough. You're going to need God. You're going to need God Almighty. I don't even know how to explain to the church what's going on with me. I thank God for this back surgery. Because it's humbled me. It has made me see my weakness. It has made me realize my frailty and the briefness of time. Now I don't care what other churches are doing. I'm not worried about them. They're not my business to worry about. But I am concerned that we would be and have all that God wants for us here. I, I, want, to, I want to do a couple of things. You hang on to your hat. I, this Wilson family right here, I love you with all my heart. I want to tell you boys, I wish I'd have been a better pastor to you. And if I've ever hurt you and caused you to stumble in any way, I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. I don't want to be a stomach. They've been here for so long. They're the ones that I think of, you know. Poor little boys had sat here and endured my preaching all these years. But I do not want to be a stumbling block. This thing is real to me. They was up there singing while I go about till death and dying or whether I live or whether I die. I poured my whole life into this thing. If it's not everything, it's nothing. But it is everything. Let me say today, if you're here and you're not saved, all this other stuff don't really matter to you. you. You're not saved. You better get saved. You be the nicest guy in the county and die and go to hell. I appreciate these young men seeking the Lord. And boys, I tell you what I'd do. I'd write it down in my Bible. 
Let me tell you something. thing. If you stumble and you fall, get back up again. It's 12.30. Let's stand together. You pray as long as you want to, young men. Pray as long as you want to. Everybody, no rush on nobody. But I want to have a word of prayer. Oh, my Father in heaven, I pray that you'd have mercy on me. Lord, you know that this has been a storm and a battle in my life. It seemed like, Lord, nearly as long as I could remember. But God, I do know that your grace is sufficient. And I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for supernatural intervention in my life where you've kept me when I would have destroyed myself. And I thank you, God, for your grace. And I, like Ruth said to Boaz, why have I found the grace in thine eyes? Because, Lord, you could have threw me away, set me on the shelf years ago. But, God, I, I know from reading your word and from the visitation of the Holy Spirit that you want us to live in victory over this so great issue. That has destroyed so many nations and families and, and men. Until God, we are no longer men. We are just literally spiritual wimps. Who don't even have the power to control our own drives. God, today I don't know. I just pray for these young men in this church. I tell you, Lord, I appreciate, I appreciate them so much, Lord. And my heart rejoices when I look and I watch and I see what you've been doing. And God, today I pray that you'll hear their prayers in a mighty way today. That you'll do exceeding abundantly above all that they might ask or think. But I pray, Lord, that they would be humble men, humble men with virtue. And that the very first thing after their salvation, their faith, would be adding virtue to their lives. I pray, God, today that you'll give them the love of God shed abroad in their hearts that they not want to hurt any of these girls. That they not want to hurt your name and blaspheme. Lord, I remember where Nathan came to David and said, By this deed you blaspheme the name of the Lord. Lord, and the whole country excused its perversion because of what David did. Father, his son accelerated and put his foot on the accelerator and took the brakes out. And Lord, that nation was ruined. God, today, I knew, you know, Lord, this message has been heavy on my soul all week long. And I feel like a hypocrite because of my own struggles and battles and storms with this issue. But I know this much, God, that your power is a power that can win, a power that can conquer all our foes, even our own flesh. I pray, God, today that you'll hear the desires in the hearts of these young men, that you'll prepare a young lady for them, a lady who'll have virtue and encourage him in that virtue. I pray, God, that for those, Lord, that you have ordained to be single, we pray, God, that you'd give them the grace of God and the joy of the Lord Strength, Lord. God, I pray today for the fathers and mothers, families of this church. Oh, God, this evening we're going to come out here and I just pray we'll have a great time of fellowship and joy in the Lord. And even this evening, Lord, them young folks kind of eyeing each other once in a while and checking each other out. And Lord, when that little leap in their heart Maybe Lord comes because they think they're kind of interested in her or him. That there'd be a spirit of holiness come over that. And that Lord, they'd know they're treading on sacred ground. God, I just want you to be glorified. And I want you to spare these kids a lot of sorrow, a lot of tragedy, a lot of grief. Lord, I pray our homes would be holy. Our hearts would be holy. God, we love you. I pray again for these young men. Not or be amiss to not pray for all these sweet, beautiful young ladies, Lord, that's in this church. I pray, God, that you'll give them a joy of the Lord in accepting who they are and not be worried about Hollywood beauty. 
I pray God fill these girls' hearts with the holiness unto the Lord and give them faith against all odds that there is somebody that can love them and love them exclusively and intimately and that they can spend wonderful days and hours visiting together and loving together and enjoying the life that you've given. And Lord, when I think that when you created this world, got down to the final and ultimate thing that you did in creation. You created Adam, took Eve out of his side, brought her to him. And Lord, I tell you, if there's ever been a picture of heavenly bliss, it has to be right there. God, grant these a little bit of heaven while they're on earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll see you tonight. We're having fellowship outside. Bring a chair. Bring food. We're just.